thank you very much for your kind and warm welcome. What I'm going to try and do for you is I'm going to try and deal, I said we're going to deal with a series of questions during the course of this weekend, this one tonight on arrogance. Where I'd like to try and start in dealing with the question, the complaint, the issue about isn't the Christian faith inherently arrogant is by just first of all making just a few sort of general introductory remarks before getting into the heart of what I want to say and then allowing you to come back and ask me questions. Now the first comment I want to make is just at a general philosophical level. And the way this works is, look, how can you Christians... Why is it that, you know, you're claiming to sort of like a type of philosophical exclusivity that we're just not comfortable with? How can you possibly try and say that, you know, exclude other people or say that they're wrong? Now, there's a moral side to this complaint. I'm going to deal with that next. But I want to remember, I just want to just deal with the philosophical side. Now, from a philosophical level, what you have to remember is as soon as you say anything, you're automatically excluding something that will come against it. For example, if I were to stand in front of you this evening and say, all paths lead to God. I would at the same time be saying that those who believe that only some paths lead to God or only one path leads to God are wrong. Okay? I think that's not right. Now, if I were to stand before you and say, look, only some paths lead to God, because I'm not so sure Adolf Hitler had such a great way. Okay? I am saying that those who believe all paths lead to God, it doesn't matter which way you're going, or only one path leads to God, are wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're saying, look, there's one way, some ways, many ways, always. However you phrase that, what you are going to be saying at some level is, look, I think that people who hold a different opinion to this are wrong. That's just simply the way that truth works. Truth is always going to exclude that which somehow comes against it and says, no, 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 I disagree with you. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be arrogant. It's not arrogant to pick out any one of those things. Arrogance is an attitude which is attendant to the conviction that you have. And we're going to talk a lot about that about much later. But from a philosophical point of view, because we've struggled so much with the idea of truth, is there such a thing? And can it be known? We've then automatically said that anyone who's claiming to have the truth must be arrogant. But if you're saying anyone who claims to have the truth is arrogant, then you are claiming to have the truth about those who say they have the truth and are therefore arrogant. And if knowing you have the truth leads to arrogance, then you sort of fall into your own trap. You see where this is going. If you like, I can say that again, but much more quickly, and it will sound even better. <laughs> but I think you'd probably get the general gist of, of where that is going. Now, the second thing which is connected to this, and it's very interesting to note how very often issues of truth and morality are very closely connected. So when you complain that someone's been lying to you, you're basically saying, that's a moral complaint, but you're also saying they're not telling the truth. If you've ever been betrayed in a relationship, it's because someone wasn't truthful to you in it. And so truth and morality are actually very more intimately and more closely intimately connected than most of us realize in our day-to-day -day life. But the second way goes like this, and it's sort of, it's connected to the first, but it's maybe slightly stronger. I remember I was speaking a few years ago at an event a bit like this, and um, at the end I said, look, any question you can ask me, you can ask. And a lady stood up and she said, okay, I have a question for you. She said, you didn't say this in your talk, but you seem to assume it is true. She said, you assume to be saying that you think that the only way that you can really know God is through the person of Jesus Christ. Is that correct? And I said, well, that would be correct. And then she said, well, I wouldn't want to be an immoral person like you. That's why I'm a Buddhist. And so at the end of the meeting, I went up to her and I just said, I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yes. I said, you're telling me that you don't want to look at what Christianity says because you think it's immoral. It's morally wrong to go around saying other people are wrong. She said, that's right. I said, didn't the Buddha say that Hindus were wrong? Didn't the Buddha say that the caste system was evil and that the Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, were not actually divine revelation. And her mouth fell open, and she said, he did say that. I read it this morning in my devotional readings. So I said, well, look, if you're prepared to believe in the Buddha, even though he said other people were wrong, why are you not prepared to listen or pay attention to what Jesus Christ said? Because he said other people were wrong. She said, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> and I said, I can appreciate what you're saying. I said, I understand the concern you have. I said, but it seems to me that the concern you have is going to somehow reflect back to you. And actually, we became friends through that particular encounter. And um, she was in a church the next morning, probably because she still wasn't quite sure what I said. And so was deciding to come back and see if it was me or her. But we actually got on quite well. Now, the third issue to deal with this whole thing about arrogance and exclusivity, which I do want to touch on, and it's becoming increasingly bigger, is, is more to do with both with attitude and outworking. 
There was a very famous professor of political thought at the University of Oxford called Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin wrote many, many books and was sort of a towering intellectual figure of the 1960s. And two, he was a, a polymath. He wrote about all kinds of subjects, history, philosophy, political theory, economics, and so on. But two things that he continually came back to, to look at, to examine, as a scholar and as an academic, were to do with the issue of freedom, what does it mean to live in a free country? And the idea of monism, the idea that there's only one form of truth. And Isaiah Berlin lived and saw communism, fascism, Nazism, and so on, all come and go. And these things bothered him. And so what Isaiah Berlin did is he began to say, look, he said the idea that if you want to have a free society, if you want to have a libertarian society, you must have one where you have pluralism where you don't try to say, look, one, there's just one type of truth. There are many types of truth. Now, the way he defined pluralism is different to how many people define it today. And I, it would take me a long time just to explain the differences between those two things. But it's important you understand he's not talking about pluralism as if we were, if you know what postmodernism is and the way that a postmodern would talk about pluralism. Something, to him, it was something slightly different. But what he basically was trying to argue was that we have to somehow create a free and loving and just society. And the essence of that was pluralism, okay? the idea that there are multiple truths. And Isaiah Berlin, the way he put it was this. He said, the enemy of pluralism is monism, the ancient belief there is a single harmony of truths into which everything, if it is genuine, in the end must fit. He said, the consequence of this belief is that those who know should command those who do not to cause pain, to kill, to torture, are in general rightly condemned. But if these things are not done for my personal benefit, but for an ism, socialism, nationalism, fascism, communism, fanatically held religious belief or progress, or the fulfillment of the laws of history, then they are in order. And then, a little while later in the same essay, he goes on to say, monism is one step away from despotism. You see what he's saying? He's saying, if you have a group of people who believe they have the truth, they will then believe that they may employ any means necessary, no matter how brutal they may be, to make everybody believe in that truth. Monism is always a step away from despotism. If you believe you have the truth and you're sure about it, then you're always in danger of becoming a despotic. I can remember while I was reading that essay, I was also reading through the Gospel of John, where in John 1.14 it describes Jesus Christ as being someone who is full of truth, but also full of grace. Full of truth and grace. Now when you describe someone as being graceful, what you're saying is that there is a beauty to their physical movement. Not many people seem to call me graceful, but I know about this in theory. When you describe someone as being gracious, you are saying there is a beauty to their inner movement. The moral workings of their life work out in a way that is beautiful to behold. Is it possible to have a truth that's filled with grace? A gracious type of truth that is beautiful to behold in how it outworks even in the life of someone. All of us have probably met arrogant people. And it's probably true to say that all of us maybe live in fear of being attacked by someone who seems to be supremely arrogant. And if that has been your experience of church and you feel that maybe what has turned you off, potentially being interested in what it means to be a Christian, if you are in a situation where you have experienced something like that, then I am genuinely sorry and I would like to apologize for it. But it does raise up a very interesting issue, particularly with the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, for example, is very often accused of being arrogant. The Apostle Paul was, many of you know, the writer of the most part of the New Testament. And it went like this, he seems so sure, he seems so certain, he seems so self-assured. Imagine when I walked into this auditorium this evening, I stood in front of you, and my first line to you was this. Ladies and gentlemen, I've flown all the way over from Oxford tonight to tell you that I know for sure I am going to heaven. Now, how does that sound? And the answer is, it seems to sound to many people as being very, very presumptuous and certainly arrogant. Because, in effect, what I seem to be saying is, guys... I'm better than you. I'm so much better than you that God himself is eagerly awaiting my arrival in heaven. <laughs> and I've just come here to tell you Americans really, A, why we're so superior, and B, why you need to get your act together. And of course, from my perspective, things started to go wrong in 1776. <laughs> and we're going to have to go a long way back to put everything right. But, you know, it can still be done. So the question still then remains, and it's particularly acute within the Christian faith, where the idea of assurance of heaven, of being able to say, I know, undermines 
any idea that maybe, surely that just simply breeds arrogance. It's, it is inherently arrogant. What makes you think you're better than everybody else? Now, the way I'd like to try and respond to that is by taking something that Jesus said, which I'm sure will be very familiar to many of you, and trying to look at it with slightly fresh eyes, and then draw the lessons out and apply them back in. In uh, the Gospel of Luke, Jesus told a parable. He said, look, two men went to the temple to pray together. And they both go to the temple and they both pray together. One of them was a very religious man. Okay? He was a Pharisee. Now you need to be careful when you hear that word. Pharisee, most of us, we think, what well, you need to understand when Jesus used that word, a Pharisee means someone who is very morally upright. Okay? Someone who, if we were alive today, would most certainly be in a religious setting like this very, very regularly. Okay? And the other guy was a tax collector. Now, I'm sorry if you do work for the IRS, but it's universally true that tax collectors are not normally considered to be very popular people. And if you are a tax collector and you're suffering from rejection, then please do come to the talk I'm giving about how to live with suffering. <laughs> and the other one was a tax collector who was certainly hated. Jesus said they both went to the temple together to pray. Now the Pharisee, he stood somewhere near the front because he's a religious man. And he stands there and he says, God, I'm better than everybody else. Now, he tries to introduce a dose of humility into it because he's a type of a Calvinistic humility here. I want to be careful how I use that word. Some of you may not know what that means. But what he basically does is he basically says, God, you made me better than everybody else. You did a great job with me. Hey, and, I, and I thank you that I'm not like all these other people, adulterers, you know, cheats, liars, murderers, and especially tax collectors. You know, well done, God. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, I'm tithing plus a little bit extra. And that's basically what he prays. It is very self-assured, and it is very self-righteous. Now, the tax collector, however, he's standing at the back of the temple. He's looking down at the floor, and he's beating his chest. Now, I was raised as a child in the Middle East, and in the Middle East, when people mourn, if you're very, very upset, if you're in a state of deep contrition, well, in those kinds of settings, what happens is, well... Men, well, especially now, what they do is they tend to fire guns up into the air. But women will normally beat their chests. Okay? Men will do other things, anything from tearing their garments to shaving their head or their beard or what have you. It's very unusual for a man to beat his chest because that's what women do. But this tax collector is so sad about the situation he finds himself in, he beats his chest. So Jesus said, this guy is standing in the back and he's beating his chest and he looks down at the floor and he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, that this man, the tax collector, he went home having been justified before God rather than the religious guy. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Now what's going on in this little story? Now the difficulty is that we're going to have to put ourselves back to try to imagine the setting that Jesus was talking in. In Aramaic, which is the language that everyone spoke in Jesus' time, in Hebrew, when you say, I'm going to the temple to pray, you're saying one of two things. Either one, I'm going to the church, you know, it's empty, I'm going to sit down somewhere quiet and just pray. Or I'm going to a big service. It means both. Okay? You could be coming to an event like this, or you could be coming by yourself. Now, in this context, they're coming to an event like this. We know that for two reasons. Both men come up to the temple together. They both leave together. They both pray at the same time. But it's the prayer in particular that you realize tells you the context about what's going on here. Because what the second man prays, what the tax collector prays, is not, Lord, simply have mercy on me. Now, I don't know if there are any visiting Episcopalians here today. I go to an Anglican church back in England. And if you have a formal set of liturgy, there's a little thing called the Kyrie eleison that you may say. Do we have any Episcopalians here who know what the Kyrie eleison is? Anyone visiting? No? No Episcopalians? What a shame. <laughs> you say, oh, I go to the Anglican church, which I guess is linked with this Episcopalian church over here, because obviously the queen is, is head of the church. And so, you know, given my feelings about 1776 and all of that, it just seems like a good idea. <laughs> So I do like Baptists too, but that's a whole other issue. So in the Kyrie eleison, what people stand up is they say something in Greek. 